We're here in Chicago at Expona 2024. It's going to be a great show. Check out our coverage. And please check out our Facebook page, the fastest growing audiophile Facebook page, over 12,000 members in three months, the listening chair with Howard Neller Group. I'm Howard Neller. I'm Kemper Holt. And welcome to The, the Listening Chair. chair. We're here in the Ear Experience Expo Hall and we're with Costas Metaxas of Metaxas and & Sins and, uh, on the right and Jeff Garson of uh, Real Sounds who's the North American distributor for the company and uh, we're going to do the best. We got a little background noise, some people walking in and around in the back but this I think this is the best we can do because we're in a big hall here. So uh, um, Costas, you know, I didn't know where to start. Your stuff is, is just different than anyone else's here. Can you explain to everyone what you have going on? Okay, um, thanks for having us here, Howard. Uh, basically, basically the most important thing is that uh, I've been doing this for 40 years. So 40 years ago, I started humbly in Melbourne, Australia, and we started actually in Australia, but we were selling for the first, say, six or seven years outside of Australia. We never sold anything in Australia. We sold everything to Germany, Germany, Switzerland, Holland, Italy, France, and in those areas we were like a reference, particularly in the German press, uh, because we, I developed some amplifiers at the time which sounded really, really good. So I was only a young kid, I was a student, um, so obviously at that time I, I got the electronics right, but I was then looking for a way to style it. So that was how it all started. Of course in the early days the styling was more traditional, more normal, but by about the 90s that's when I started going a bit more crazy with the styling. Uh, but I only knew what I knew. So for me, my parallel career was in media. And I was annoying people who were like architects, like Zaha Hadid and Frank Gehry, uh, fashion designers like Uber de Givenchy, Pierre Calan. And of course, this is in the 80s. And so I was picking up from these people what made them so special. And I was trying to learn that to do the same in the hi-fi business. Now, in the hi-fi business, obviously that's the aesthetic, but the sound, what I was also doing at the same time, I was probably the first person who had uh, a Goldman reference. I had it before Harry Pearson had it even, because Goldman was my distributor in Europe, and I was their distributor in Australia. So I had the best of the turntable stuff, but then somebody mentioned to me that tape was a lot better as a reference, uh, so I then went to Otterev in Switzerland, met with the Stellavox people, and that's where my whole tape thing started. And with tape, I was able to do my own recordings, so I had my own references. So this was like to get the sound right. And then to get the visuals right, the most important thing was, again, eating, learning from these people. Uh, we're talking the best watchmakers, the best, uh, you know, um, car designers. You know, I was meeting the guys who were doing the mercedes Benzes and people like Wolf Reitzler from BMW, who was the one who spearheaded the, the, the big push from BMW back in the late 80s. So you understood from these people what was necessary to do something that was groundbreaking, that had to go further. But at the same time, you had to understand if you had what it took to do that, because obviously you could pick up ideas, but then to put it together into something that makes sense. So. All that work in the luxury business informed what you see today. What you see today is the hi-fi industry um, put on steroids because no one really has had the guts to do something like this. The reason being, of course, is because it's not you know, hugely commercial. Well, let me back up for a second. How long did it take before you were really had your aesthetic? This, this aesthetic is 10 years old. Prior to that, I was doing a more traditional aesthetic but still a little bit avant-garde. But 10 years ago, I thought if I'm going to continue in this business, either I go for broke or forget about it. Because, you know, it's a, you look at these halls, there's so much. Uh, my son, when we go to Munich, says, Dad, why does everything look the same? And I said, well, that's the nature of this beast, unfortunately. So 10 years ago, I took the, the decision, either I do something that blows my mind and then hopefully blows the mind of the customer, or don't bother. And the first thing we did was an amplifier called the Icarus. And the joke was back then, to find someone who could machine this crazy stuff was the biggest headache. 
Right. So we found someone who could do it. They made some mistakes. We almost got out of business straight away, but luckily they were able to do it. We did a big show in Munich back in 2017, I think it was, and that was when we launched this crazy look. And at the start, people just, to be honest, didn't know what to think. And also they thought, well, this can't be serious, like usual. But you can imagine someone like Van Gogh, who when he first came out with his paintings, where back then the Dutch uh, masters were doing typical scenes of you know everyday life, and then you saw Vincent Van Gogh doing you know this crazy, rich, full of paint, full of colour, and no one took him seriously. And of course now his paintings are far more valuable than any of the other Dutch paintings. So you have to take that stand. So I did that, and I learned that also from the luxury business. When you're talking to Givenchy, when you're talking to these guys, you, you understand what made them special is they're pushing the envelope. There was a fashion designer called Romeo Gili, who was a crazy Italian, and he was an architect as well. And he said to me, Costas, he goes, because I was asking him, how does he do it? How do you come up with this? And he said, well, he says, you have to, you have to push yourself because if you don't, you're nothing. Okay. So in other words, whatever you do, if it doesn't really knock your socks off, it, do, it doesn't need to exist. So okay. all these objects you see here, they are really MoMA quality. You know, somebody sees it who's an art fanatic, they get it. It's not just audio files. In fact, the audio files are still slowly coming towards it. But I don't particularly want to be uh, sort of doing the same old, same old. Cassis, let's fast forward to today at the show. Uh, you know, we've, we've taken some video on, that we've, we're putting on, on here of the gear, but from your perspective, what, what are the, some of the more important pieces that you've brought? Well, basically, what we're trying to launch here, or showing here particularly, are the headphone amplifiers, which are really quite unusual and revolutionary. They're ethereal. This is an electrostatic headphone amplifier, high voltage, which is shaped like a mannequin, like a moulage mannequin. That is the starting point. Then we've also got our electrostatic speakers, which we're showing for the first time here. And this is a, gr a real game changer because it's probably the first electrostatic that is really full range, easy to drive, doesn't beam, doesn't do all the things traditional electrostatics do. So that's another thing. And then the other thing we're working on is a new tape recorder, which is in between the Tourbillon and the Papillon, which is using no pinch rollers. So it's similar to the ATR100 idea of a tape path that is totally unrestricted. Well, yeah, what I'm trying to do is always show that we are really high tech as well as beautiful aesthetic. So the audiophiles and other people who are not audiophiles can understand. We are like Ferrari, we're like Formula One. Also here we're showing the, the perambulator, the newest version of the perambulator, which uses pure titanium tone arms. And the aesthetic is part of the design so that it evacuates all the vibrations away from the vinyl record as it's playing but at the same time sort of keeps it all happening so then you get this huge sound stage incredible detail and that's part because of the titanium arm as well as the way it works okay and um, as far as you know this is obviously this is art and what kind of prices are we you know talking here generally uh, i'll go over to jeff for that <laughs> okay great jeff North American prices range, obviously, depending on, on what the item is. So, for example, of their new speakers, the Prince, Prince electrostatic speakers would be 24000 US dollars, which is relatively reasonable for a speaker of their caliber, quality, and unique looks. Uh, the uh, perambulator turntable would be roughly $30,000, and then the tone arms are around $6,000 each, and you can add up to two tone arms to it. And in light of the fact that we are dealing with artwork here, really unique pieces, how, how is your distributor role different than it would be with a typical manufacturer? You know, it's interesting. When, when I was first in touch with Costas, it was because of the beauty of his products that I was drawn to it. And I believe that in North America, we hadn't seen anything like it before. So uh, I feel in a way like I'm a representative of an, art, of an artist. And so therefore, I have to educate uh, there's a lot of education that goes on with it, but at the same time, my great joy is seeing people's reaction to his creations because everybody gets a smile on their face when they see his stuff. Awesome. Well, I know it certainly put a smile on my face more than a few times because I've obviously seen you guys around and Jeff, we did a, yeah. remember we did a video back at uh, Innovative Audio. That's right. That was very well attended. So yes. uh, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing how the products develop in the future. Thank Our you. pleasure. Thank you, Howard.